beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the early 60s of the previous century, the song was recorded and released as a single, and the name of the song was I Am a Woman. It was sang by Peggy Lee. It reached number 12 in the U.S. pop charts, and many other artists and commercials used the song. And a new version of the song was even released in 2013. And the video reached the top 10 of the iTunes music video chart. I beloved, this song highlighted the emancipation of women in the United States and in Europe after the First and the Second World War. And ever since that time, the position of women in a Western society changed, has changed dramatically. For the first time in history, nearly all women received the right to vote, to participate in politics. And today the position of women in our society is unique in the history of human rights. And as the saying goes, when it rains in the world, it drips in the church. We also have been influenced by emancipation, by a worldly view on women, more than we are aware of or will admit. And the place of sisters in the church has changed a fair bit in the past century. The discussion of women in special office as elder and de or minister in our late Dutch sister churches is proof of the remarkable changes within the churches. Now, it's not my intention in this sermon to engage in the discussion about this topic and women in office, although an important topic, is definitely not the last and the only thing to say about the place of women in God's world and church. God's word, beloved, speaks far more extensive about the place of women and their responsibilities and the use of their gifts in the church than we often talk about. God's Word speaks about that. And not the world, but the Word defines the place of our sisters in society and in the church. And therefore God's Word should be proclaimed on the extensive calling of women, both in the Old and the New Testament church, and be applied also in our times. Since God gave the first sister Eve a special place and calling in the garden next to Adam, and continuing in that calling even after the fall in sin, God builds His church also with women as spiritual stones. And this morning we hope to see from the Bible how the Lord throughout redemptive history uses different kinds of women in different situations to work the coming of His kingdom. So I preach to you God's word regarding married and single women in God's service under the theme, the Lord uses women as spiritual stones in His house. First, the, we will look at the contribution of the virtuous wife in the church, and second, the true widow in the church. The Lord uses women as spiritual stones in His church. First, the Contribution of virtuous wives in the church. Beloved, the opening chapters of Genesis are of fundamental importance to understand the position of men and women. In his wisdom, God wanted to create two genders, male and female, Genesis 127. And here we also see that God created them both as equal image bearers. The one is not more than the other. Both receive, receive the cultural mandate to fill the earth and subdue it. Both have dominion over nature and culture and to develop it. Man should not be alone, God said. 
And together they had to dedicate themselves according to the ordinance of God. And although man was made first and received first line responsibility, the woman was made as an helper comparable to him. Genesis 2 verse 20. She is not less than man. She is not made as a slave, but of, as a helper of man. They were made, they were created by God to mutually complement one another. Now the fact that Adam was created first is not just a historical fact, but also indicates the different unique callings. And although their unique roles and positions have been affected after the fall of sin, Genesis 3, verse 16 to 19, and they've lost the, their beautiful harmony in working together, it didn't change the creational order and the guideline for the complementing service to God. Unfortunately, man started to abuse his position and physical dominance. Even to the point that Lamech, against the creational order, took for himself two wives, introducing polygamy. Remarkable is that the Lord, in His grace, tolerated this sinful custom, not only with Lamech, but throughout the Old Testament. Unfortunately, we know also the effects of that in marriages. How devastating it was. Yet the Lord protected the women in the Old Testament church. He made several laws for that. When you are at home, read Exodus 21, particularly verse 10, about their marriage rights. And the women in Israel were often more respected compared to those among the heathen nations. Equality between men and women, according to the creation order, was set by God, although not always respected by His people. And so we find that socially and juridical women had a fairly limited position. The way that women were treated in the Old Testament, also by, by godly men like Abram and Moses and King David and King Solomon, would not have been tolerated in our times. Yet women also had a certain level of freedom in the daily Old Testament life. Women could speak to men in public, 1 Samuel 25 verse 2, be involved in, in trade. We read that in Proverbs 31. They were involved in different elements of farm work, Genesis 29, and also served the kings in the king's palaces in different occupations, 1 Samuel 8 verse 13. Several women were willing also to speak up for the sake of God's law, even young women. And we see that this is also an example. How the, your, how the Lord used women, sisters in the Old Testament church, for building the spiritual house. How about us? How about our sisters today? Are we also willing to be used by the Lord as living stones? Like, for example, the daughters of Selophat, Numbers 27. Are we willing to come up for the Lord, for the law of the Lord? Speaking up. Are we also today willing to give our last $20 of monthly grocery money for the urgent need of another? Like the woman who was willing to sacrifice her and her son's last meal to the starving prophet Elijah. 
are we also today willing to be used as spiritual stones, as, as the Lord used many other women in the Old Testament, to speak about God's great acts and His will for His people, like the prophetesses Miriam and Deborah and Huldah and the wife of Isaiah. Are we as sisters willing to make ourselves available as living stones like Eve did and Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Jael, Hannah and Ruth, Naomi and Esther? Are we willing to be used by the Lord as He used all these women as spiritual stones in the Old Testament church? And even more in the New Testament church, are we as sisters willing to be used by the Lord as spiritual stones in the same humble and serving way like, like Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist? And when the Lord wants to use us for certain special tasks like He did with Mary, do we then say, also say, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Or are we too self-occupied with ourselves, with our images? Are we willing, as spiritual stones, to write poetry about the Lord's work, like Mary did in her song in Luke 1, verse 46 to 55? And are we, as older sisters, awaiting the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with the same faithful acceptance as the prophetess Anna in the temple, serving the Lord with fasting and prayer night and day. Yes, do we have the same zeal to serve Jesus Christ in the same way as those women who supported Him during His ministry? Women like Martha and Mary and Johanna and Susanna who served the Lord and His disciples. Are we ready and willing to be used as stones in the way that we receive gracious forgiveness from Christ also for our secret sins as sisters, just like the Samaritan women or the adulterous woman in John 8. Maybe you are still seeking Christ. Are you then also willing to express your seeking faith like the Canaanite women in Matthew 15 verse 21 to 28? who was willing to receive even the little crumbs of grace from the Lord? Do we as sisters weep about our sins and show our appreciation for Christ's sacrifice, like Mary of Magdalene, who anointed Him and dried His feet with her hair? Are we willing to be sent as Christ's messengers, like those women He sent at the morning of His resurrection? Are our homes open to others to meet and to stay like Mary, the mother of John Mark, in Acts 12, verse 12? Or Lydia of Philippi, in Acts 16, verse 15? And if the Lord gave us the gift of teaching, are we willing to reach out to others like Priscilla, who with her husband received and taught Apollos? You know, have a cup of can use also women as volunteers to reach out to others. Are we as sisters willing to set aside our internal personal differences and disputes to be of the same mind like the two sisters Iodia and Syntyche who labored with Paul in the gospel? Are we serving like Phoebe in Romans 16? Are we full of good works and charitable deeds as Dorcas, the living spiritual stone in Joppa? What are we teaching our young ones? What will you be teaching Georgia as she grows up? To be close to the Lord as a sister in the faith. Are we as elderly sisters Willing to be used as living stones, according to Paul's word in Titus 2, verse 3. Reverent in behavior, not slanderers, 
but given, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. Do we also make ourselves available to support young women in the church, in their families, and if needed, admonish them in a humble way, willing to study and discuss up-to-date books about raising children and combine that with <coughs> our life experience, and then help the young women, the mothers, with it, not in a I-know-it-all way, but in a balanced, spiritual way, so that they can grow in their walking with the Lord within their families, according to the truth of God's Word. And are we as young women, young mothers, willing to listen to those older sisters in order to reflect a Christian lifestyle that the Word of God may not be blasphemed? Beloved, if our sisters are in church are willing to serve in such a way as living spiritual stones, the Lord will bless them with the gifts of the virtuous wife of Proverbs 31. For this passage that we read is not given by the Spirit through King Lemuel's mother in order to make godly women wives feel inferior because they can't comply with all these virtues. And don't read this passage and say, well, if this is the standard, the standard level of a godly wife, then I might as well stop being a wife and a mother. I will never reach this level and comply with these standards. No, this passage doesn't start with the question, what does a perfect wife or mother look like? No, it starts with the question, who can find a virtuous wife? A perfect woman, a perfect wife does not exist in a sinful world. No, not one wife has all these gifts, these virtues, these qualities as described in verse 11 to 29. You may have some of it. Another sister might have other gifts. Now, the clue of this passage is in verse 30b. This is a virtuous wife, a woman who fears the Lord. She shall be praised. The fruit of her hands, according to her God-given gifts, and done with a dependent and faithful heart, that will bring her praise. Such living stones the Lord can use in His church. And also a side note to the young single brothers. When you seek a wife, don't look for a perfect one. With a perfect look, with a perfect personality, they don't exist. But seek one who fears the Lord. They are praiseworthy. They are good wives. Love, this was a bit of a long point, but I hope that the line through Scripture showed us that to God, every faithful serving wife counts. Each one of them are blessed and useful stone in His house. At this point, I may assume that several single sisters might think, all good and well, but what about me? I'm not a mum or a wife. I'm, I'm single. Or I'm a widow. How can I then be a spiritual stone in God's house? Well, let's see that in point two. The true widow in the church. <clears throat> Beloved, first of all, it is remarkable that the the Bible speaks very little about unmarried, young, and middle-aged women. Particularly in the Old Testament, the families arranged the weddings of their daughters and made sure they, that, that they got married. For there was often a bride's prize at stake. Think about Laban's trick to make Joseph of Jacob marry Leah before Rachel. <clears throat> and when a woman... A woman remained single for the rest of her life, she stayed with her parents. Or when they died, she was seen as part of her brother's household. 
Moses and Aaron, for example, looked after Miriam. And Lazarus looked after his unmarried sisters, unmarried sisters Martha and Mary. The only other single women in the Old Testament we know of who were single are Sifra and Pua, midwives, who dedicated their lives to save the male, male children in Egypt. Exodus 1 verse 15 to 21. And by the way, they later received households as a reward from the Lord. And there's also the daughters of Shalem, who joined their father in repairing the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah 3 verse 12. Besides that, it did not occur very often. In the times of the New Testament, <clears throat> the only single women, not being widows, who are mentioned are Phoebe in Romans 16 and Dorcas in Acts 9. Now it is clear from Romans 16 that Phoebe was a living stone in the church of Kenfria, a place close to Corinth. And she had a special task as a single in that church. She was a helper. With that position, she also traveled to Rome, most probably to deliver the letter of Paul in the church or to the church of Rome. Whether she had other responsibilities in the congregation there in Rome is not clear, but it seems as if she had to support the others ministering the gospel in Rome. Anyway, Paul asked the congregation to receive her in a worthy manner in Romans 16, to assist this special sister in her task. It's not impossible that she was a rich, independent sister with very special gifts. She even received the status of prostatus. That's the word used for Roman curator. However, women were not allowed to be curators in the Roman government system. So Paul uses the word prostatus probably in the context of worshipping contribution to the Roman goddess Phoebe. So we see here when Paul recommends Phoebe to the congregation that he says she's Phoebe, she's a deacon prostatus. And then with a special sense of humor alluded that this sister is a real Phoebe, a real caring woman. However, this Diaconos prostatis, prostatis, as that she helped many in the church, including Paul in his ministry. The other single sister was Dorcas, who was restored to life by the Apostle Peter. She clearly was a hard worker, full of good works and charitable deeds. It seems as if she had no family around. And her focus was on serving the widows in the church. For upon her death, the widows, not the relatives, stood by her body weeping. And upon her reviving, Peter called the saints and the widows. She could then continue serving the widows, and as such was used by the Lord as a living stone in His house. Beloved, especially the single sisters, among us. How encouraged could we be by such a reference in God's Word? For if God could use Phoebe and Dorcas, He can use you too. Single sisters, pray that the Lord will open doors for you to serve His spiritual house, also with the gifts that He bestowed upon you. And now as a conclusion, a word to the widows in our midst. You know that in the Old Testament, the Lord gave all sorts of laws to protect the widows. For example, Exodus 22, verse 21. Onwards, God's people had to protect the widows in their midst in every possible way. And for example, Isaiah 1, verse 17, they are called to plead for the widow. Yes, the Lord Himself defended the widow. We'll sing later from Psalm 68 and 146. And the widows themselves need to trust the Lord, says Jeremiah 49 verse 11. So it's clear, beloved, from the Old Testament that the widows had a special place among God's covenant people. 
care for widows is also prominent in the New Testament. Even to the point that it qualifies a Christian lifestyle. James 1 verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their troubles. And from the Gospels we see plenty examples of Jesus Christ's care for the widows. Think, for example, the widow of Nain, Luke 17. Widows also occur frequently in Jesus' parables and teachings. And the care for the widows continue in the first churches, Acts 9, verse 41. And now in that letter that we read, the first letter of Paul to the young minister Timothy, Paul extensively deals with the position of widows in the church. And he distinguishes between widowers, widows who still have relatives to care for them. They should also be spiritual stones in God's house in that they support their parents, verse 4, and their family. And for the sake of God's honor and the gospel, they ought not to waste their time going from the one coffee social to the other being gossipers and busybodies. No, rather, they should seek for a husband and remarry if possible. And then again, they could be useful living stones in God's house. That was the one group. The other group was the widows of those who were 60 years and older, who had only one husband, but have no relatives in the church. For them, Paul had a separate task. They formed a special group in the congregation. They were single and fully dependent on the congregation. But they were not only poor victims of their fate. They were to take Anna, Luke 2 verse 36, as an example and trust God. And continue in supplication in prayers day and night, verse 5. And they were, they were even especially chosen and appointed to give good witness through their conduct in life. And from verse 10, we can conclude that their task was in those areas on which they received a good testimony. If such a widow has brought up children, if she has lost strangers, if she has washed the feet of the saints, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work, they should as a group together of 60 plus widowers, they should continue to do this in the church. Preferably they are not to remarry, but dedicate the rest of their lives to the Lord. In this way, God could use them as spiritual stones, but also to witness to those outside of the church for the sake of God's glory. Congregation, do you see how important, after what we have seen in all three of these passages, how important the women are in the upbuilding of the church? Actually, they, only they can really sing Peggy Lee's song, I am a woman. Not emancipated, but sanctified to serve as a living stone by the Lord. Our sisters in the church are created as image bearers in full standing within their families, but also when they are single. And Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 50, For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. They are Jesus' family. For them, he also gave his life on the cross. So for the Lord, the ultimate living stones in his church are not determined by gender. It could be male, but also female. But eventually by a deep spiritual destiny, which is not embedded in marriage, but in God's glory. No marriages are needed among or any more on the new earth. But the Lord will need each one of us, call each one of us, male and female, to worship Him 
forever. Marriage would have its fulfilling in the beautiful relationship between Christ and His church. A mystery that will be revealed when Christ brings His spiritual house to completion. So let us as sisters be encouraged to continue in serving and living stones in this congregation. May the Lord bless you in this. Amen.